Please take a seat. We're going to begin with a meal prayer, so everyone just make your way over. <clears throat> so the, the wonderful food is blessed before we all dig in. So I'd like to introduce my friend, Father Dennis, who will lead us in the meal prayer. You can remain seated. Let us begin in our Lord Jesus' Our Lord God's holy and precious name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We ask for an outpour in the Holy Spirit upon this gathering here. Also, firstly, upon President Donald Trump and Melania and the whole family. We thank them for hosting us here in their place. We're joy, it is quite a joy to be here. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming and being in this room and blessing our speakers to share the truth, the truth of God himself, our beautiful Catholic faith. We ask a blessing upon John Yep and Catholics for Catholics, beautiful growth in this holy organization. We ask also that Mother Mary, Nuestra Senora Guadalupe, will wrap her mantle of love and protection around us and all of our families. We ask also a blessing through St. Joseph, his feast day today for his protection his guidance. Let us pray the meal prayer. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God bless you in our Lord's holy and precious name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Protocol and tradition would dictate that we sing, of course, our national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance, which we will do now. And normally, on this kind of event, you bring some fabulous person in person to lead us in that national anthem. But that person is not here tonight who will lead us in the national anthem and Pledge of Allegiance. However, we will still sing it. Please rise. And I present to you the J6 Choir. to the flag of the United States of America. to the republic for which it stands. under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. a seat. 
You were probably forewarned that it would be a powerful night, and what a powerful way to begin. My name is John. I'm with Catholics for Catholics. We... <laughs> We are Catholics. We are Catholics and we are Americans. Both of those characterizations or labels impart a duty and a responsibility. American, to, to be a part of the greatest political experiment in the history of time, which is at such serious peril at the moment and Catholic, to have this knowledge and access to the sacraments of the Catholic Church to motivate us and to get us ultimately to the heavenly goal. We have a duty and responsibility. And tonight we're going to talk about that duty and responsibility as it incarnates into a concrete choice which Americans will face in November. Who to choose to be the lead, the greatest country in the world? Now, whenever you have something good, and please, by the way, start eating. Whenever you have something good, someone else usually wants that. You're attacked. President Trump is the first person. How would they have gone after that man? And he stands and keeps going. Well, here in America, there's an enemy at the gates. It's an enemy that, as Catholics, we're really familiar with. It's communism. Atheistic Marxism. Did you know? We go way back with this, with this uh, foe the Catholic Church does. In fact, two years before the Communist Manifesto was even published by Karl Marx in 1848... We had already released our first encyclical condemning it. We smelled the rat. The Catholic Church, the Bride of Christ, takes care to guard the children of this world from those forces which try to rip it from, from the hands of God. Atheistic communism has marched through the past century, leaving a trail of blood and destruction, the real bloodbath we have it at the gates it's inside the gates today in this country we have a choice in November it's not so much a choice between two people it's a choice between two systems one is atheistic communism the second is a, is a democratic republic represented by Donald Trump which only can continue when it is buttressed and support by faith and morals of a just society. That's our role. That is our role. <clears throat> Pius XI, you're wondering, why the heck did you have it on a Tuesday night, March 19th? Honestly, it's probably the worst day, middle of the week. The experts out there told me, you're doing a gala in three weeks, and you put it on a weekday? <clears throat> A Catholics, we can rally to the party super easy. But just for the record, next time, don't all wait till the last like 48 hours to register, okay? I, I hope it's not like that when, we, when we're trying to get into heaven. Just don't wait till the last minute, everybody, okay? Do some advanced work, okay? So you get your QR code and you get through the gates of heaven, okay? Why not March 19th? It's the Feast of St. Joseph. Okay, great, cool. Well, did you know that 87 years ago today... Pius XI, of happy memory, published the encyclical Divini Redemptoris, which condemned atheistic communism and placed, quote, the vast campaign of the church against communism under the standard of St. Joseph, the husband of Mary, the father of Jesus Christ. He is the terror of demons. Any exorcist will tell you that. And he, an exorcist will also tell you that in the ancient rite, the power flips between the possessed person and the church represented by the priest the moment 
Bad actresses elicits from him his name, and he names him. When you name your enemy, you control it. And we're naming that tonight. Atheistic communism is in the gates. We're going to see today how that's happening. <clears throat> and how President Trump is our protection against that. We need to get behind him. So let me introduce the first speaker. So we're going to have four issues tonight, four concrete issues where we see this played out so you know I'm not just talking about it. These are human rights issues. Before that, I'm going to invite my friend up here to give a little history lesson, a reminder of the bloodbath that communism has placed in the world in the past century. Our next speaker is the senior editor for Human Events. He's a former naval veteran intelligence officer and has written three nonfiction books, Citizen for Trump, Inside Story of a People's Movement to Take Back America, and Tifa, Inside the Black Block. Posobiec and his family reside in Washington, D.C. Let's give Jack Posobiec a hearty welcome. So did you ever hear the one about a thousand Catholics who got together at Mar-a-Lago and decided that we would join together with all forces who would stand with us to destroy communism and save Western civilization? I don't actually have a punchline. I just, I, I, I thought that was, no, that's actually what's going on. It's not a joke. Uh, but he, let's hear it for John, by the way. Amazing work putting this together, Catholics for Catholics, to set it up in, in such a short time. Because we have to be able to move quickly. We must be able to move swiftly because the hour is growing short. The time is growing late. We do not have much time left. Earlier today, just about 45 minutes drive from where we sit and where we eat right now, Dr. Peter Navarro, the senior advisor to President Trump, one of the top thorns in the side of the Chinese Communist Party, and the first man in the entire country who called for the firing of Anthony Fauci was put behind bars. Let's hear, let's hear a round of applause for a patriot, a hero, and a proud American, Dr. Peter Navarro. a political prisoner, and let's get it going loud enough that Peter will be able to hear us behind the walls of that jail in Miami where he sits tonight. Peter Navarro was locked up because he refused to submit. He refused to surrender because he kept the faith because he kept the courage of his convictions. And when the January 6th show trial of a committee, which broke every rule under the sun, which broke every law under the sun, which deleted evidence, which deleted communications, which didn't even offer witnesses the chance of a cross-examination, when they called him in, he said, no, I refuse. That is the energy we need as Catholics, as Christians, and Americans going forward. The courage to say no, to say I refuse, I will not take part in these demonic works. I will not take part in the works of Satan. You know, all of our parents were asked when we were baptized, and I had a friend, my producer Angelo, who his son was baptized just this past Sunday, and the priest reminded us that every single baptism is in fact an exorcism. Every single baptism is in fact an exorcism of the original sin of that which we are born. This country needs an exorcism. 
this country and the forces plaguing it are truly being fought on the spiritual level. And I know that in this room you all understand that or else you wouldn't be here tonight. And I know that I must have gotten it right or else Michael Knowles would have fact-checked me by now. <laughs> well, actually, Pasovic. <laughs> I don't know why he's talking like Ben Shapiro, but okay. <laughs> the foe we face is a foe that the church has faced for hundreds of years. It's been called communism. At one point during the French Revolution, it was called reason, it was called egalitarianism. The same French Revolution that desecrated the beautiful cathedral of the Notre Dame, Our Lady's beautiful cathedral there in Paris, the statues of the 12 kings of Israel smashed outside, the stained glass windows smashed by the forces of Robespierre and the revolution. And they changed the entire, people don't even know this history, they changed the name of the Notre Dame de Paris to a temple of reason. And they celebrated festivals of reason and enlightenment to replace Catholicism, to replace what they called superstition and the dark ages with the enlightenment of righteousness and truth. Gosh, that sounds a lot familiar, doesn't it? That sounds like something that I could have said right now. And yet we live in a country where for the past several years, both here in the United States and in Canada, dozens if not over a hundred churches were attacked, were burned, were persecuted, people outside, Catholics and pro-lifers and Christians alike, persecuted by the very government that is supposed to represent them. And I submit to you that the French Revolution was itself a proto-communist revolution. And we all, know, and may, many don't know, that the very end of the French Revolution was the execution of the Carmelite nuns of Copignan. Twelve nuns that they took from their cloister and they demanded them, renounce your vows. Take off your habits. Renounce your vows to the church. Not a single one of them complied. They said, we refuse. And it is said that as they made their way through the streets of Paris, with the French revolutionaries cheering as they were led to the guillotine, that they never stopped singing hymns to our blessed mother as they were led up to be decapitated in the French Revolution. They never gave up. And it was just 10 days after that, that Robespierre himself lost his head. What can I say? He became a good communist. <laughs> Folks, at the time, it, wasn't, it didn't even have the word of communism yet, and John Yep mentioned that earlier. We saw what happened in the, in the Russian Revolution when it was Marxist-Leninism. We know what happened in China when it was called Maoism. And I would submit to you that the new communism of our day does take its name in essence from this same line, but it is a new Marxism, not necessarily of economic, though economics does play a role. This is cultural Marxism. This is the foe that we face today. Because here in the United States, we had a strong middle class, at least until Joe Biden got in office. And the middle class that's now under attack, the landlords, the Christians, we know that's who they always come for first. The religious, the small business owners, the wetty, the petty bourgeoisie, as Marx would call it. Now, we faced this foe for hundreds of years. And for hundreds of years, we refused to be defeated by this foe. This foe was not defeated by the communists of Russia. This foe was not defeated by the communists of China, not by the revolutionaries of France. And I submit to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, that the United States of America will not bow to social, cultural Marxism, that we will stand for our principles. And with God as our witness, we will live up to those words 
in God we trust. This nation was founded on those values, regardless of what your teachers might tell you, or regardless of what the media might tell you, founded from nothing on those principles. The media loves it when I say that, by the way. And that was the country that was bequeathed to us. It is not a country that was given to us, a country that was founded in tatters. It was a country that was founded to be made more perfect. And it is our right and our duty to do so. And so what my friends and I and my, my coworkers and I have been doing at Human Events is we've been categorizing these communist revolutions throughout the ages. And we, we've put up a huge series of podcasts called The China Files. Many of you may have seen that. We put up another one earlier this year, The Chronicles of the Revolution, and we're getting all the way up to the cultural Marxists of today. And so tonight, I'm proud to announce that we have signed a deal with a publisher. We are going to be publishing all of this in a new book that will teach us all how to identify the cultural Marxists, how to use their playbook against them, how to crush their revolutions, and we will specifically call them that which they are because they reject the human rights of others. They reject the humanity of their oppressed classes. I submit to you that they themselves have become the unhumans. This is the book, and we're going to be releasing this on the 4th of July. We stand at a precipice, and it's very simple. We can choose to go down the road of cultural Marxism, of wokeism, of social justice warriorism, or we can choose to restore the United States as it was founded in its original form. You know, they say, why is it that people still support communism after communism is responsible for 100 million deaths? Well, it's simple. They want the 100 million deaths. They view the 100 million deaths as a good start because their lack of humanity is only compounded by their ability to destroy, to tear down, to equalize. They're not, they don't care about equality. Theirs is an ideology that's born out of vengeance and envy and pride. They took the seven deadly sins and turned it into an ideology. That's what they're trying to force on our country. That is what we will overturn and we will restore America to greatness. We will restore America to confidence. We will restore the Christian values. And in just a few months time, when Donald J. Trump is rightfully restored to the presidency of these United States, we will begin to set it all right. Are you with me? I said, are you with me? Do you reject the left? Do you reject cultural Marxism? Do you reject Satan and all his works? Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of speakers tonight. Thank you so much for this gracious opportunity. It's an honor to speak with you, an honor to be here with my family. God bless all of you. Ave Maria. Jack pulled the jack. That's what he does best. Tonight, as I said, as we lay out the case that President Trump is the only Catholic option, we are going to lay out four concrete issues that matter to us Catholics, and really matter to all Americans. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, every election season, they republished their list of non-negotiables that we should not compromise on. You don't negotiate them. Great word. Our non-negotiables are the four issues which you will see tonight. The first one is the right to worship and freedom and the ending of the unjust targeting of religious groups, specifically Catholics, and political opponents. And each of these issues, which we'll talk about, 
will present to you someone who knows it well and also someone who's lived it. I'm going to introduce our lead off tonight to introduce that topic about ending the weaponization of the DOJ against faith groups and political opponents. Steve Friend is a former state and federal law enforcement officer with more than a decade of experience. As an FBI agent, Steve investigated child trafficking and domestic terrorism. In 2022, he became an FBI whistleblower after making protected disclosures to Congress about the FBI's questionable and manipulative investigation of January 6 prosecutors. He is also the author of True Blue, My Journey from Beat Cop to FBI Whistleblower. Please welcome Steve Friend. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here to address this group. I want to tell you a story about what all FBI employees do. All FBI employees go to the Holocaust Memorial and the MLK Memorial. And the purpose of that field trip is to hammer home that if you see the agency going off the rails, it's incumbent on you to throw the flag. Because things like civil rights atrocities and genocide can only occur when police just follow orders. And if anyone's ever been to the Holocaust Memorial Museum, you'll see the Martin Niemöller poem very prominently displayed there. First they came for the socialists, and I was not a socialist, so I said nothing. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I was not a trade unionist, so I said nothing. Then they came for the Jew, and I was not a Jew, so I said nothing. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. We need to proffer a new version for the FBI. First, the FBI came for General Mike Flynn with a hoax, Russia collusion. They sent agents to interview him under false pretenses. They actually sent them over there and said, our hope is to get him to lie so we can charge him with the crime. They dragged his name, his reputation, and they destroyed his family for politics. But I said nothing because that was just politics. Then the FBI came for Mark Houck, man who was accused of committing a FACE Act violation because he was doing preaching outside of an abortion clinic. And even though state and local law enforcement chose not to charge him with any crime after he defended his son from a Planned Parenthood employee, the DOJ and the FBI saw fit to arrest him in front of seven children at gunpoint and walk him out. But I said nothing because that's just one blue city, one rogue FBI office. Then the FBI came for radical traditional Catholics who attend the Latin Mass. Their crime, having pro-life, pro-traditional marriage, pro-border sovereignty, pro-Second Amendment beliefs. In the FBI's view, that made them prone to anti-government extremism, so they should recruit informants within the parishes and send them in to inform on their fellow parishioners so the FBI can investigate those people as domestic terrorists. But I said nothing because I don't go to the Latin Mass. Now the FBI is coming for all the rest of us. So what are we going to do about it? President John Quincy Adams said, duty is ours, results are God's. We have to do this ourselves. The first step to overcoming any challenge is admitting that you actually have the problem. The problem that we have in this country is that we're involved in a cold civil war right now. Our side says things like, we can all get along. We all want the same thing. The other side says that which is not banned is required. You will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. It's the Borg from Star Trek. So what can we do to respond? I'm a believer in the bullseye principle. Use all the ammunition that you have to hit the 10 ring. If you have any left over, then you expand out. So what's our 10 ring? Our 10 ring is our family. We need to be home indoctrinating our kids every single day. We have the added benefit of being right. 
We know that there's no my truth or your truth. There's just the truth, and it's murder to go through an abortion. We have to pressure on that nine ring. We have to pressure our local representatives. We have to demand courage from our sheriffs to divest from a broken FBI. We have to require our state representatives to pass laws to protect us against an out-of-control, weaponized DOJ. We have to go to school boards and remove the smut from the school libraries. And last, we have to go to the largest level. We have to go to the feds at some point. And we have to demand that they defund the FBI. The days of allowing the weaponization that I have just described to you in return for avoiding a partial government shutdown are gone. It needs to go away, shattered and scattered to the wind. The book of Esther teaches that we are all born for such a time as this. God has a plan and a purpose for all of us, and it's not to do the wrong thing. We are here for such a time as this, to engage in this civil war. The hard truth is that no one in this room is going to live to see the end of it, but we were still born for such a time as this. So I encourage all of you to join me in the fight ahead. Gideon needed 300. America's gonna need a lot more than that. I thank you very much for your time tonight. God bless you all. It still hasn't gotten old, that picture or those stories of Mark Hook with his 11 kids or 10 kids having his house raided at around 4 a.m. in Pennsylvania with a full-out SWAT team. I know many Catholic dads around this country, those who are involved in patriotic stuff, it's crossed our minds more than once. What would trigger something like that on my house? And what would I do? It's real. We love justice in this country. We love our law enforcement. But we want justice for all. The right to worship, not being targeted. It is the number one right, and it's the number one thing that atheists and communism always goes after. We want to present you someone who's lived it outside this country. In fact, I was speaking with his dear wife, Martzena, and she spoke about how as a little girl in Poland, she passed around those solidarity pamphlets when the government wasn't looking. They know what this is, and they have stood up to make religion essential because it is essential. A successful Polish-Canadian businessman who grew up in communist Poland, Pastor Artur Pawlowski, immigrated to Canada in the mid-90s. Once settled in Alberta, he grew a small, unknown ministry into a TV show that broadcast 120 million satellite dishes. Beyond this, his ministry distributed hundreds of thousands of meals per year to those in need. The best clip that where I got to know this guy was when we were all sitting at home watching... People go to Walmart, the liquor store, and every other quote-unquote essential thing we were restricted from our churches. Pastor Arthur led the way. And when they came to his community of believers in Canada, he told them the answer, the correct answer. Get out, you Gestapo. The founding fathers, amen to that. If you would have told the founding fathers to stop going to church, tell George Washington, stop going to that church that he frequented in Alexandria, Virginia, he would have looked at you and said, whatever. Religion is essential. Let us welcome Pastor Arthur Pawlowski. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me here. It's a, it's a great honor to be among American fighters, American eagles flapping its wings, a roaring lions. So ladies and gentlemen, today I speak to you on behalf of all preachers that are being prosecuted and persecuted simply because they believe in the word of God. I am standing here on behalf of the journalists that are being arrested for nothing more than just doing their job. I am here on behalf of millions of Canadian Christians, truckers and farmers that are being denied their right to worship their God and to live their lives in peace. We must understand that when religious liberty falls, all the other rights will follow. There cannot be freedom without the freedom to worship. America belongs to God. There will be no free America without the God of freedom. I stand here having faced over 120 court cases, over 340 citations, and I have been imprisoned almost 20 times. Thank you. I was kept in metal cages and in solitary confinement, threatened and abused, charged, and attacked without mercy. They tried to burn my house when my children with my wife were sleeping. They tried to burn our church and they vandalized it for three months. My crime, being a clergyman. The truth, my friends, is that dangerous to those liars. And yet, here I am, standing in front of you, not moved and not shaken. For I am a son of the living God. I am willing to pay even a higher price, but I cannot do it alone. We, the Canadian Christians, need our American brothers and sisters to stand in solidarity with us. As a kid, I grew up behind the Iron Curtain under the boots of the Soviets, and I've seen the power of the United People. When they took it to the streets, when they were singing hymns, when they dragged that huge big cross on the streets of my nation, our cities, the biggest, meanest empire, the Soviet Union, crumbled. They did it before, we can do it again. My friends, North America needs to turn to God. When we stand together in unity, Protestants, Catholics, alike, and every child of God, we will truly become unstoppable and unbeatable. With God's truth, we cannot and will not lose. My friends, we have already won. The Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. When God shows up, it is over. For our enemies, America, bring God back to America. The cross and the flag married together in a holy matrimony of freedom. Benjamin Franklin once said, fear God and your enemies will fear you. Some time ago, I saw a scene in a movie called The Patriots that deeply resounded with me. A young girl speaks to the churchgoers, and here is what she says. Will you now, when you're needed most, stop that only words? Is that the sort of man you are? I ask only that you act upon beliefs of which you have so strongly spoken and in which you so strongly believe.
I have the same question to all of those that claim to be Christians. Are we not the servants of the Most High God, the Creator of heavens and the earth, the Alpha and Omega, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the life itself? Do we not believe in the Word of God, the truth? The one that said, stand for what is right? Will you hold the line? I was the first trucker without the truck to be arrested during the biggest Canadian civil rights movement in the history of our country. My crime, I gave people hope. I told the truckers to hold the line, to stand for God and state-given rights, and to do it for our children. To hold the line for what? To hold the line for our families, for our children, for their children, for the future, for prosperity, for faith, for the church. There comes a time when a real man, especially a man of God, must say a shepherd must tend his flock and at times fight off the wolves. A man of God does not shut down the church. A man of God keeps it open. A man of God fights against evil and represents God's kingdom. The history, the history of the church, the history of blood, the martyr's blood that refused to bow before the evil during their time, it's our time now. When injustice is done to one of us, it is done to the rest of us. When one hurts, we all hurt. Here is what Martin Luther King Jr. said. The ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over that by the good people. So my question is very simple. Are you the good people of America? Are you willing to hold the line? Are you willing to stand up and push the great evil that crept in? It is time for the great American eagle to flap its wings once again. You've done it before. You need it again. It is time for the land of the free and the home of the brave to roar for the whole world to hear. Let them say that in America, church is a force to be reckoned with. My friends, we are the church. We shall never surrender. We are the lions of God. We are the messengers of hope. I quite often wondered why they kept me in metal cages and solitary confinement. Why they charged me with insane charges. You see, the enemy fears the truth and the enemy fears a man that preaches hope. They are after hope. And you have a man that is willing to bring it to you, your rightful president of the United States of America, Donald J. Trump. This world desperately needs hope. We must give it to them. Ladies and gentlemen, let's not just make our beloved America great again. Let's make America blessed again. Let's make America godly again. In Jesus Christ's name. The word of God is more powerful than any tongue. The truth is more powerful than any gun. And we are commanded to go. So go.
into all the world, the Bible says, and preach the gospel, the good news to all creation. Because America has hope. America is hope. Now go and give it to the rest of the world. Thank you so much. Do you know one of the comments people were sending our direction as we were getting this event uh, going, you know, getting our first round of speakers released and then more started to join on. One of the comments that we heard kind of a fairly regular was, okay, this is a Catholic prayer thing, but not all of your speakers are Catholic. So how does that work? Let me explain. Once upon a time, the Lord himself was walking with his fellow Jews at that time. And he spotted a pagan, a centurion, a Roman soldier. And he said, that man over there has more faith than anyone in Israel. It was the Lord who knew how to recognize the virtue and held it up as a symbol to model. Of course, I believe that it's the one, I'm the, it's the one true faith, the Catholic Church, obviously, as I would expect anybody else. But it does not stop us to look at the virtue and to be inspired by that, which pastor does. And he, we were talking before about this. He's actually a former Catholic. And he said, I asked him, so why'd you leave? He said, because of the corruption in the church that I saw. And I said, Pastor, boy, do I hear you. And we're going to get to that in a, later on. But his point remains. He's a man of courage, and we thank him for his testimony. We also invite him back to the one true faith. That's nothing like the Eucharist, right in the Blessed Mother, St. Joseph. Our next issue, our next speaker, or next issue, that's right, is we talked about the right to, to worship, the first fundamental one. The second one, the right to life. The right to life. This is the most sacred, cherished thing. <laughs> this is not going on away. This is, transcends the, 20, the November election. There are 10 states which have on the ballot to determine whether the right to kill a baby is permanently enshrined in the state constitutions. It's already passed in Ohio. That is not a good thing. The right to life. These are non-negotiables. We don't negotiate these. I'd like to bring one of the best experts on this, a friend, a warrior been around for many years battling on this to defend the babies in the womb and the end of the destruction and the harm that it causes the women and the men who have those abortions. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how you were conceived, the right to life is the greatest thing. St. Thomas Aquinas would say that. Frank Pavone is one of the most prominent pro-life leaders in the world. In 93, he became National Director of Priests for Life. He's also the President of the National Pro-Life Religious Council and the National Pastoral Director of the Silent No More Awareness Campaign. He also served as President Trump's 2020 Pro-Life Coalition Co-Chair and Catholics for Trump. Despite his tremendous pro-life work, he was defrocked in 2023, a visible sign of some of the confusion that's happening today in the church to courageous priests. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Frank Pavone. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you all, brothers and sisters. 
You know, on the abortion issue, the other side likes to say the government shouldn't be so involved in abortion. And they actually don't realize how right they are. The government got too involved in abortion when it pretended to have the right to authorize it. That's when the government got too involved. Brothers and sisters, the government has no authority to authorize the killing of a baby, period. We know who we are as pro-life people. People are arguing today, well, where should we draw the line as to when a baby can be killed? And there's only one answer to that. We have no authority to draw any lines. As soon as one is human, that is God's property, God's right that we are defending. You cannot kill a single child. We also know how to win elections. We also know how laws and public policies are crafted in this nation. We, being Catholics, do not allow principles to make us forget how we have to apply those principles. Brothers and sisters, when you're in a situation where wanting to protect every child is not something you can just wave a magic wand and do, what you cannot do, you are not responsible for. God doesn't hold us morally responsible because we can't do the impossible. A law cannot be passed unless you have a majority of those in that lawmaking body ready to pass it. It is time to stop criticizing politicians, candidates, and holders of public office for simply articulating how much they believe they can do at the present time and saying to them, you're less pro-life. They are not less pro-life. We are gathered here tonight at the home of the most pro-life president this country has ever seen. And he will continue to be. I want to call on my colleagues in pro-life leadership. I want to call on every pro-life activist in America. This is not the time to pretend that President Trump is running against some perfect pro-life advocate. I don't expect him, President Trump, or any candidate to do my job. My job as a pro-life leader is to articulate this message, to persuade people on this message. I don't expect them to do my job. In fact, it wouldn't bother me if these candidates didn't even talk about the issue very much at all. I need their signature. I need their signature on the right kind of legislation. I need their signature on the appointments of judges. That's what I need. I don't need them to be a pro-life advocate. But brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, the Democrats think they can win on this issue. They want to bring it front and center. And I say to them, be my guest, but have the courage to describe what you defend. That's what they will not do. That's what we have to challenge them on. Show us an abortion. You want abortion? Tell us what it is. Read the medical textbook. Show us what it does. They read the medical textbook, they're going to hear the word dismemberment. They're going to read the word decapitation. They're not going to tell the voters that that's what they're advocating. But we know what it is, and we're going to make sure the voters know what it is. You point out the extremism of the other side. You challenge them to describe what they defend. And then we win on this issue when we lead with compassion. We are the ones who stand for women's rights, women's health, women's equality, and we're the ones helping them every day. When we lead with compassion, when we expose the extremism of the other side, and when we work with common sense, we will win on the abortion issue, we will win for President Trump, we will save this nation. God bless you all. Okay, so we're not supposed to call him father, but A, you are still a father to us, telling us 
of the dangers of protecting us. And secondly, to us such charitos and eternum, and no power on earth can remove that you are a priest forever. Thank you, Frank Pavone. I'm a Chicago Bears fan. <laughs> I hear the laughter. We hate, I hate getting outsmarted. It's, it happens the last 20 years. I think we're, we're just as of three days ago, we're going to try our, our like 10th quarterback in 18 years. So we're a bad team. We get outsmarted. But we got a good GM, so hopefully that's going to work better. Nobody likes to be outsmarted, do they? Well, guess what? Did you know that when this whole abortion thing started to seep into American society, suddenly the false right, because rights are only that which spring forth from the human nature, a nature created by God. That's a natural right. There are false rights. There is no right to eliminate the life of a child. There was a strategy implemented to help us flip that. It was conjured up by the other side. Well, we know what that strategy is, and we have someone who gave a testimony, gave an interview to that person who created that on their deathbed. I'm going to present to you Terry Beatley is founder and president of the Hosea Initiative, a national pro-life education organization. The organization is based on the compelling pro-life journey of Dr. Bernard Nathanson, formerly known as the abortion king and the creator of the Catholic strategy. He converted on his Beth Beth dead through divine mercy. Let's give a welcome to Terry Beatley. Well, those are some big shoes to fill, but I'm going to give it the best try I have. Good evening. All right, according to God, as recorded in 2 Chronicles 7:14, healing a nation requires God's people to do penance and turn from our wicked ways. What if, though, over half of God's people are deceived? By decades, decades of godless communist propaganda, which made abortion an extreme wickedness acceptable to so many people. The needed repentance may not ever happen. How will we ever reach God's people for conversion and repentance? How will we ever go about doing this? Well, it will not only be through politics. We can reach them through love and telling the most compelling, unknown, true story of our day, the conversion of Dr. Bernard Nathanson, father of America's industry of abortion, who turned child of God. Amen. Now, don't you take my time. Don't you take my time. His story reveals God's divine mercy to even the most egregious sinner who repents for an incalculable injustice perpetrated by him, which led to an immeasurable, irretrievable loss of human life in this nation and beyond. His story lifts the veil of deception, undergirding the satanic sacrifice and his story can be a catalyst for millions of people to repent for their apathy and or their participation with abortion, which includes voting for pro-abortion candidates. Dr. Nathanson's legacy is so relevant today because this atheist doctor followed the science Back in 1973, and on a new technology called real-time ultrasound. And you know what it did? It revealed to him 
the humanity, the personhood of that little baby in the womb. And did you realize the father of America's industry of abortion in 1973, the same year we got Roe v. Wade, began his pro-life conversion. Boom. And Americans don't even know this doctor's story. Later, he exposed the Catholic strategy. Strap yourself in. I would bet three people in this room know this. It was a four-part tactical plan, General Flynn, designed to, number one, shame Catholic bishops into silence. Number two, manipulate enough Catholic voters to support pro-abortion candidates. Do you think it worked? He admitted that the anti-Catholic warp was the keystone, the central strategy to the abortion movement. Folks, those are Stalinist words. And he called it a religious war against the Catholic Church using Stalinist-like propaganda. And then lastly, when Dr. Nathanson commissioned me on December 1st, 2009, to teach the strategy of how he deceived our nation, he also implored this. He said, tell America to love one another. Abortion is not love. Stop the killing. The world needs more love, and I'm all about love now. The father of the abortion industry. America is dying for this story, and it's been buried for way too long. God's people should be telling it. So by the way, in your gift bag tonight, you will have this fact check booklet, and I got more to share with you, but everybody will get this, and my goal over the next nine months to 12 months is my hope is 90% of American Catholics will know this story and start sharing it with other people because the power of story works. It changes hearts. Look us up at Hosea Initiative and let's get the job done because we will never save this nation as long as this nation is slaughtering God's children. Amen. Thank you. The last speaker and witness, it's great, better, better use of the term witness, to the defense of these rights, the right to life, that's the second issue. Patricia Sandoval is an international pro-life and chastity speaker who has traveled around the world since 2007, sharing her story of three abortions the highest work of Planned Parenthood, and her nearly three years as a homeless drug addict. Her story is a testament to the saving love and mercy of Jesus Christ. Patricia currently hosts a weekly television program, Pro-Life Report on EWTN Espanol, and the author of the book Transfigured. Let's give a great warm welcome to Patricia. It's an honor to be here tonight. I was a victim of the abortion industry for the first time when I was in the sixth grade. The sexual educators came to my classroom to give us sixth graders a course on safe sex, responsible sex. That day in 1992, at the age of 12, my innocence, my purity was taken from me, from their perverted lies. They never spoke to us about the beauty and sacredness of sexuality. They never spoke to us about the consequences and the tragedies when you have sex before marriage. They never spoke to us about the beauty of motherhood, the beauty of fatherhood, or even the dignity of human life. They told us that when a woman is pregnant up to 20 weeks gestation, 
There's no complete formation, so therefore, it's just a clump of cells. It's just a sack of tissue. Remember, this is 1992. We didn't have 4D ultrasounds. We didn't have internet, YouTube. What we were taught in school that day, we believe, as 12-year-old children, that that was truth. They taught us that when a teenage girl finds herself in an unwanted pregnancy, it is your body, it is your choice. And if your partner wants to have that pregnancy, he doesn't have a choice because it is up to her, to the female. You see, the abortion industry set up a trap for me, set up a trap for my future, because they know that children are not receiving the proper formation in their home by their parents. So the abortion industry becomes the sexual educators. They give the distorted formation to the little ones. And Satan, Satan goes after the little ones. I walked out of school that day, 12 years old, pro-choice, minded. Seven years later, that trap that was set up for me, it was to their benefit and it worked because I found myself with three unwanted pregnancies and three unwanted crisis pregnancies, and I believed that a pregnancy, that a child would destroy my dreams. I suffered after three abortions, severe post-abortion syndrome, nightmares, anorexia, hair pulling disorder, post-traumatic de de post stress syndrome, depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, anger bouts, crying bouts, but the most severe of it all, suicidal thoughts. My partner also had three abortions and he also suffered post-abortion syndrome because yes, men also have abortions and yes, men also suffer the consequences and yes, men need healing after abortion. Amen. Still believing abortion was a woman's right, I applied for a job in the year 2000 at a Planned Parenthood facility. Once the manager learned that I was post-abortive and that I was bilingual, she urgently needed me to work for them. She hired me as an illegal back office nurse with no nursing credentials, never went to nursing school because she urgently needed my Spanish. When I was trained on the job, they trained me never to use the word baby, father, mother, he, she. I couldn't even use the word fetus because even the word fetus gave human dignity. I was instructed never to let a woman or a teenager look at her ultrasound. If you see a woman cry in our facility, you ignore those tears because Abortion is her only option. It's her only choice. There's no other options but abortion. I had to assist the abortionist for the first time, and that's when the veil was ripped out of my eyes. When I stood behind the abortionist's shoulders, it was very violent because abortion is violence. It was a violent scene. The young girl was kicking and screaming, and I thought that the abortionist would retrieve the cannula, the sharp instrument he was using, the vacuum machine, but he couldn't because if anything is left behind, any piece of tissue can result in an infection and she can die on that operating table or even after. And it dawned on me, wait a minute, how does he know he has a sack of tissue? He cannot see what he's doing. And that's exactly what abortion is. It's a blind man's surgery. So when you get these people on the left saying, Legalize abortion to make it safe, that is also a lie. Because legal or illegal, it is unsafe. It's a blind man's surgery. It's the same exact procedure. I had to go into a hidden room behind the doors of Planned Parenthood, and I truly thought that I was gonna look for the sack of tissue. But when my coworker took out a pair of tweezers and she started to dig in, inside of that Petri dish, to my shock and my surprise, she lifted up to the light the body parts of a baby, the little hand, the legs. And when she finally lifted up the fifth part of the baby, which was the head, I saw that little baby's face. I contemplated the anguish, the fear, and the mouth wide open as if this baby was screaming for his life, but he was completely voiceless. Only heaven and God heard the cries of that little innocent baby. 
and I realized they lied to me. I was deceived. I did not abort three sacks of tissues. I aborted three of my own children, and it was very painful to work there. I only worked for three weeks because I would cry every single day working behind the doors of that abortion clinic. Working behind the doors of an abortion clinic is one step before going to hell. They don't care about women. They don't care about children. Women faint. Women cry. Women are forced. They're pinned down. And I knew the truth about abortion. I was heartbroken and the pain was great. I didn't know God very well. I forgot about God, the God of my infancy. And I started to use cocaine. I started to use methamphetamine and I became an addict. And quickly, I became a homeless person addicted to methamphetamine, living on the streets of California with no hope and no life in me. I was literally a dead woman walking. Until one day when I was on the streets with no food, I thought I was gonna die that day. I cry out to God and I repented and I asked for his mercy. And this young woman came out of a restaurant and she looked into my eyes with these eyes full of love and mercy and she said, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. I saw you crying on the street and I started to pray for you. And God told me to tell you that even if your father or mother shall forsake you, that he will never forsake you and he will be with you until the end of time. And everything that you have done, he forgives you. Because no matter what we've done or where we've been, when we repent with our whole heart, Jesus comes in as the king of divine mercy. That's who he is. And it was because of the grace of God and my mother's prayers that I'm alive today. So mamas that are here, keep praying for your family. God listens to your prayers. He is faithful. You keep praying for your family members. I decided to go public with my story in 2007 and the cross has been heavy. It hasn't been easy. There's been a lot of persecution in my life, but God has been so faithful to me. I have a beautiful husband. He's a St. Joseph a little handicapped St. Joseph, but he's my St. Joseph. And I didn't know if I could be a mom after you know, having one abortion, you run the risk of being infertile, but God has given me two little girls. My family's here with me tonight. And as a family, we serve the pro-life movement. As Christians and as pro-lifers, we believe that life begins at the moment of conception. And science also proves this, regardless the circumstances. And I know there's a lot of pro-lifers or a lot of Catholics or Christians that say, I'm for, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the pro-life movement. I'm against abortion. But in cases of rape, no. We must be pro-life and no matter the circumstances because, because abortion will never undo a rape, ever. What that woman needs is love and support with her child. That's what's gonna help her heal. For the word of God confirms to us, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. He knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb and he had purpose for our life. Every life has purpose in the eyes of God. If a politician cannot defend a human from the first moment of his existence, then what can he defend? In 2020, President Donald Trump was the first president to attend in person the March for Life in D.C. Amen. President Trump especially praised the youth and the attendants at the March for Life, saying, young people, you are the heart of the March for Life, and it is your generation that is making America the pro-family, pro-life nation. Women that are here, you are the soul behind the pro-life movement. But men that are here tonight, you are the strength and the force behind the pro-life movement. You were created for greatness like St. Joseph. You were created to be the head and the authority of your household. You were created to become strong protectors of life, strong protectors of the women, of the children, of the family, and of society, just like St. Joseph. Oh, 
Saint Joseph, the Savior of the Savior, because on two occasions, Saint Joseph saved the life of the child Christ and of the Blessed Virgin Mary by protecting them both. Abortion is not only a woman's issue, but it, it is also a male's issue. The unborn have no voice. But when it comes to abortion, if the father wants to keep the life of his baby and fights for that life, and his partner wants to have an abortion, he becomes voiceless and he is silenced. Men, God gave you a voice. God gave you authority. Use it for the pro-life movement. Do not be passive or indifferent when it comes to abortion. God needs you to become heroes once again, to become like Saint Joseph. And God needs you to repair all the men that have failed society, all the men that have abandoned their families, their wife, their children. He needs you to be courageous, just like Saint Joseph. It is no coincidence that after the year of Saint Joseph, Roe was overturned. That's because of St. Joseph. And I'm going to say this, and I believe this with my whole heart. I believe that if every man on this planet, every pastor, every bishop, every pope and cardinal, every father, educator, lawyer, politician, president, I believe that if every man were to defend life, I don't believe abortion would exist. So do not fear, men. Abortion is your business. Abortion is your issue. And may everything that you do, men, be for the glory of God. And I end with the words of Saint Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Let us all pray that we have the courage to stand by the unborn child and give the child an opportunity to love and to be loved. And I think with God's graces, we will be able to bring peace in the world. And I just want to end this with my great grandfather. He was a Cristero martyr. He fought in the Cristero Mexican War and he died for what he believed in. He died for his faith and he died for fighting for truth and justice. Viva Cristo Rey! Viva la Virgen de Guadalupe! God bless America and God bless President Donald Trump. The memo calls for the FBI to develop sources within Catholic congregations. How many FBI agents would, with guns would you estimate showed up at your house? Opponents fear such a declaration would weaponize communion and weaken the bishop's ability to speak on other issues. The Dodgers reversing course after backlash from fans, elected officials, and members of the LGBTQ plus community. The team has officially re-invited the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. This is because what? Because Catholics don't tend to march in the streets. They wrote a letter via Marco Rubio, one of our most famous Catholics. But that's it. We're, we're not going to threaten them. We're not going to be vicious the way these trans activists are. Um, that's not the way we tend to behave, and they know it. They are marching to the entrance of the stadium. They will not be going into the game. The first pitch is at 7.15, and again, the Sisters of Perpetual uh, Indulgence will be honored tonight. They will be receiving the Hero Community Award, and it doesn't sit well with this particular group. We need to live our martyrdom. We need to live as those ready to die and ready to live for the blood that was shed for us all. We need to be audacious. It's kind of a fancy word, but it means be strong enough to speak for what you believe. And we need to do that. I just want to thank you from the bottom of our heart. Gracias por tus oraciones y por tu gran participación. Prepárate para seguir construyendo el reino de Cristo en los Estados Unidos de América. Católicos para católicos, vamos por mucho más. Jesus Christ is King. Amen. And his mother is our mother. We are not called to flee the world, to run away when things are difficult. 
but as devout and faithful Roman Catholics, Catholic Christians, we are to renew our country, our world, our state. But I know where our country is at. I know what it's going to take. And for anybody that's been following me or listening to me, and I, I use the phrase local action equals a national impact. Local action has a national impact. What does that mean? That means now every single American has to stand up, step up, and speak up. That's what we've been up to in the last year. <laughs> Many of you may not even know who the heck Catholics for Catholics are. It's just on this little thing right there. Like, who is that group? You have been around, like, what, 20, 30 years? 15 months ago, we started, a team of us. We were sitting in Scottsdale, Arizona, looking at the midterm races, and realize that the five most important races there, the governor, secretary of state, senate race, all had Democrats who down to a T officially labeled themselves as Catholics. We were staring at the drawing board looking at that like, you got to be kidding me. They're Catholic? Now, we're not in the business, I always say this, we're not in the business of judging people's relationship with God. That's God and their soul. I don't know where they stand ultimately, but we are tasked with the responsibility of judging their objective stances on issues. And looking at that, I can say without a doubt that President Biden is a Catholic in name only, and we need to pray for him. That initiative began. It was just a zeal of our hearts to say, this is not right. You know, people say some groups might use faith for political ends, manipulate it, get everyone all jesus up and go vote. We, sincerely, that's not us. We're the other way around. We use politics to evangelize. It is the perfect platform to talk about what we believe, in this case, Catholic. But we're not just talkers, we're doers. In the last year, we've learned here at Catholics for Catholics the power of the rosary rally. But not just, let's just go pray. Prayer attached to a specific issue and getting people in the streets packs a punch. Donald Trump has shown the power of rallies. There's one thing that you consistently hear off the many rallies that he's done. It's like going to church. I love it. You're around people, you're energized, and you, and you make a stand. We're taking that same mantra, and we will be doing that through there in this year and beyond. The rosary rally, gathering thousands in the street to make a stand like we did at Dodger Stadium or in Cincinnati to push back against issue one. Speaking of pushing back, the third issue, we had right to, right to worship. Second, right to life. Third, third of four, the rights of parents. Pushing against, back against the indoctrination and the transgender ideology, which takes parents out of the picture. See, remember, communism always operates off the principle, we know not only more than you, we know more than God. And we have, we take those natural rights, the government says that, and we're going to decide. So you noticed that all these issues have had two speakers. For this issue, there's one. Was that planned? No. Well, what happened? I mentioned this note 
not to be Debbie Downer, but just to, to get an analysis of the situation and understand where we're coming from. We have many good clergy in this country today, good Catholic clergy. But you know what the problem is? They're just good. And you don't win a battle if you're just good. And you're not declared a saint of the Roman Catholic Church unless you exhibit what? What's that? Heroic virtue. We saw one bishop in this video who is heroic. Bishop Joseph Strickland, who cannot be here tonight, but he is with us in spirit. So, of course, when we announced this event, which, by the way, was not planned seven months in advance, it was planned in three weeks, and that's credit to my team. We, of course, got the usuals coming after us. Articles in Politico, National Catholic Reporter, did hit pieces on us. One of them was actually so good, we actually sent it out to a friend say, you know, that's what they think about us. Come on. <laughs> we expected that. <clears throat> you know what I didn't expect? We had speakers ready to go on this. They were pressured to back off. By who? Not liberal bishops, but a group of good bishops who are not crazy lefties called and pressured our speakers to back away from this. That is the truth, and God is my witness. I won't mention their names, don't need to, the point stands, and you can see it. We are, the world is dying because of silence, as St. Catherine Santa said. The country is going to pieces. And I don't mean to scandalize any of you who are not Catholic or barely know anything about the church. I'm not leaving. This is, I believe it with all my heart. I studied in Rome for five years. I walked past the Colosseum all the time. I looked at that Colosseum and knew that we, that we would have to die for our faith. But there's two extremes. To be Debbie Downer about the church and negativity or to ignore and pretend that everything is okay. Everything is not okay. The church is the bride of Christ. And when the church fails to speak up in society, as these human rights issues are at stake, our freedom of worship is taken away, babies are destroyed in the womb, the southern border, which we'll get into in a second, and the state thinks that they have the ability to enter into the home of Catholic parents and decide what gender your child is. The church has got to speak up. We need her. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take to reference a friend of mine who helped inspire in a way this whole Catholics for Catholics thing. It was a priest who stood up in the middle of the COVID, in the middle of 2020 elections, and he did a famous homily. That homily shook the Catholic world and helped get Donald Trump elected. Was he political? No, he was a priest of Jesus Christ. And I asked Father James Zalman to stand up and let's give a round of applause. You cannot be Catholic and Democrat. You can't. And not to warn the sheep of that is to do them a disservice. And Father Altman warned his sheep of that. He loves those sheep dearly. We are blessed here to have patriots in this room who love God and country. A patriot, which will introduce the next issue, which weathered the storm, stood the ground as a favorite.
Michael Knowles is a celebrated host <laughs> of the Michael Knowles Show at the Daily Wire and the Book Club at PragerU. He is also an accomplished, best-selling author. In addition to podcasts and radio, Michael appears regularly on television and his writing has been featured in the Daily Wire, the American Conservative, Fox News, and more. He's also a traditional Catholic and therefore a favorite target of the FBI, and he has two sons. Let us welcome Michael Knowles. Thank you very much. Very, very kind. Thank you to John for the invitation. It is truly an honor to be here with all of you at the home of the greatest president of my lifetime. It is especially fitting to be here on the Feast of St. Joseph, patron of many things, but most notably families, workers, and the church, all of which are under attack today. Politicians attack the family legally by attempting to redefine it out of existence. They attack it materially by undermining the ability of workers to support their families, and they attack it metaphysically by persecuting the church which gives the family its ultimate meaning as a symbol of Christ's love. These simultaneous crises are no mere coincidence. In a world governed by providence, I guess there really are no coincidences, and in politics there really are never any coincidences. These crises are the consequence of a concerted effort by our liberal opponents, who rightly understand that the family is the chief obstacle to their political goals. That is because the family is the fundamental unit of politics. The liberals, liberal at best, I should say, many of them are outright Marxists. What they wish to destroy is the family and it is because they cannot control it. Because the family is not a creation of the state. It is a natural institution that exists everywhere and for all time for the generation and education of children as well as for the mutual support of the spouses. Liberals don't like that fact and I'm very sorry for them but I did not invent it. I did not set the rules and there's nothing I can do about it. That just is what it is. They can whine, they can try to change it and that will cause all sorts of political problems but ultimately it will not work because no matter how much power the liberals amass, they can't change reality. Still, they give it their best shot. They attack the generation of children by promoting abortion and the ever-expanding alphabet movement. They attack the mutual support of the spouses by denigrating fathers and depriving them of their legitimate legal rights. It was once said that there would never be a war between the sexes because everybody was sleeping with the enemy. Amazingly, today, according to certain social scientific surveys, it seems the liberals have even been somewhat successful at discouraging that. It's very impressive. But the liberals' most effective work, their most effective attack on the family, has targeted that second purpose, the education of children. Parents might not want pornography in their kids' elementary schools. They might not want drag queens reading to their children in the libraries. They may not want teachers calling their son Sally in the fifth grade. But that's just too bad, according to the libs, who insist that parents have no right to object. Still, as Pope John Paul II explained in his letter to families, quote, Parents are the first and most important educators of their own children, and they possess a fundamental competence in this area. They are educators because they are parents. Education is not just reading, writing, and arithmetic. I'm not even sure public education still includes reading, writing, and arithmetic. I think it's mostly lesbian dance theory and the like now. I don't know. I haven't looked at a syllabus in a while. Regardless, education is more comprehensive than any of those subjects. 
Education means raising a child. It comes from the Latin verb ducere, to lead. To lead people out of ignorance, out of the slavery of their base passions, and into the freedom that comes by conforming our will to reason, and which reaches its fullest perfection by cooperating with God's grace. This is why we educate children, or at least we used to educate children, in the liberal arts. Education is supposed to train us to be free. It begins in the nursery, at the dinner table, in the living room. Children are constantly absorbing the ideas and the behaviors of those around them. That is why the liberals insist on removing children from their families at younger and younger ages. My father started school at age six. I started school at age five. Today, I'm not joking, I have friends whose children start school at age two. What do they teach children at age two? What do you study? These days, you probably study the same thing that you study at Harvard, but in any case, it's very bad. It can't possibly be good. Whatever the curriculum, the first goal of the liberals is to get the children away from their families. As long as children are raised by their families, the liberals can't control what they're taught. So they have to make both parents go out to work so the kid goes to daycare. Then they have to take over the daycare. They have to take over all the schools, really. So the educators have to toe the liberal line. Then, if those stubborn parents still insist on raising their own kids, then the liberals just remove the children by force. I am not speaking hypothetically or hyperbolically. Yesterday, the Supreme Court declined to hear the appeal of an Indiana couple whose child was taken from them because they refused to believe that a man can become a woman. Indiana's Department of Child Services took Jeremy and Mary Cox's son from them at the tender age of 16 because they refused to lie to their child. They refused to subject him to harmful medical experiments. They told him the truth, and the truth sets us free, and the liberals can't have that. That court decision marks a radical shift in the court's jurisprudence, which a century ago declared that, quote, the fundamental liberty upon which all governments in this union repose excludes any general power of the state to standardize its children by forcing them to accept instruction from public teachers only. The child, the court goes on, is not the mere creature of the state. Those who nurture him and direct his destiny have the right, coupled with the high duty, to educate him. The family, in other words, comes before the state. The rights of the family precede any right of the state. Most Republicans understand this fact, or at the very least, they pay lip service to it. Where the Republicans have gone wrong, however, is on the other side of the question, on the role of the state. Because the state is natural, too. The state is important. Man is not an island entire of himself, but rather, man is the political animal. Too many Republicans in recent years have fallen into the trap of withdrawing from politics, of concluding that the government's frequent ineptitude means that we ought to focus solely on the culture or the private sector. I understand the impulse, but the practical consequences have been disastrous. It has amounted to a surrendering of virtually all political power to our opponents. President Trump, our once and we hope future president, we certainly do. <laughs> President Trump has never fallen into this error. President Trump, refreshingly, has not been afraid to wield political power for its proper purpose. The squishes recoiled when President Trump said that he was running for president to restore things like good neighborhoods, to weaken the powers that weaken our country, and to make America great again. They claimed that President Trump was usurping power 
and undermining our system of government. Of course, it was the exact opposite. President Trump understood, and continues to understand, that we can never strengthen families by withdrawing from politics to the culture or the private sector. Obviously, the man has been pretty successful in both of those realms of society. You can look around you. But he has rightly observed that we need to win politically, too, because families require the support of the state. The family, in all its splendor and with all its rights, is an imperfect society. It does not possess the complete means for its own development, temporal or spiritual. That is because man is born into three societies, the family, the civil order, and the church. The family and the state serve man's natural ends. The church, man's supernatural ends. The three are distinct, but they are not opposed, as the libs would have us believe. Quite the opposite. In a flourishing society, in great nations, the three strengthen each other. The church strengthens the family, which builds up the political order, which protects and is illuminated by the church, which further strengthens the family and the state in a mutually reinforcing harmony. The liberals wish to sever all ties, to separate all three so as to destroy them, to advance a political project of total liberation, a nation made up of strong families that educate their children to serve God, to do good, and to avoid evil will be a great nation, but it will be a nation that respects limits, a nation that subjects the will to reason, a nation that rejects tyrants. God willing, the hour is not too late. Even if it is, one silver lining of that is that there are no atheists in foxholes. Prayer is frequently our last resort, and we could all use more prayer. Really, prayer ought to be our first resort. Happily, too, we learn from so estimable a saint as Teresa of Avila that St. Joseph, as head of the Holy Family, the man to whom our Lord in his humility subjected himself as son on earth, has a particular sway in intercession. Our opponents are formidable. The threats are great. But hope is a virtue, courage is the prerequisite of all the virtues, and it is good to have friends in high places. Thank you very much. He left his speech up here. I should get an autographed copy and cake it home with me. <laughs> you know, oftentimes we hear about, uh, you know, there's the separation of church and state and church can't get political. Come on, they shouldn't be speaking up about communism and things like that. Two things, two points to that. Number one, the Blessed Mother at the most famous apparition of the 20th century in 1917, when 80,000 people, according to the New York Times, actually reported this, saw the miracle of the sun, and the Blessed Mother warned about what? The advent and rise of communism in the world. The Blessed Mother got political. Politics is a Greek word. Ta politein, the affairs of the people. The affairs, literally, the things. These four things we're covering are the affairs of the people. These are human rights. Right to worship, right to life, parents' rights. And the last one, which in the polling numbers, when you ask even non-believers, what are you most concerned about in 2024 election? It's the border. And what is the human crisis that comes forth from that? Child sex trafficking. We witnessed on the screens across America this past summer when Sound of Freedom made it to the theaters and the story was told. <laughs> it 
It truly was a sound of freedom. And the two men who were involved with that are here with us tonight. I'm going to introduce the first one. After working for more than a decade at the Department of Homeland Defense, Tim founded the NGO operation Underground Railroad, a, a covert operation to rescue victims of sex trade. He served as the inspiration for the film Sound of Freedom. We are grateful and honored to have him join us today. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Tim Ballard. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I just got some really good news from a, a really nice lady down here. She just found out that President Trump won every county in Florida just now. So that's good news. My first thought is that's very good news for the children in, th in this world who are being trafficked and enslaved. Because when he was the president, I worked with him in, in the White House on the council. I was the chairman of the, of the uh, uh, of a council to, to end human trafficking. And he has done, he did more than any, anybody in the history of this country to fight modern day slavery. And we need to get him back in. Now, when Sound of Freedom was in its peak, I stood at the Capitol and I said a couple of things. And I directed my words at the, at the current administration. 10 day, and I also suggested I might run for the, the US Senate. 10 days after that, I ex me and my family experienced an onslaught of lawfare like you wouldn't believe. And I won't get into that right now, but I can tell you that it was something like I've never experienced, and we're still in the middle of it. And it was, uh, what was it about? It was the words I spoke to, that, to the current administration, and I'm going to tell you what I said, because I'm going to repeat the words right now, and I'm not going to shut up, I'm not going to stop, and we're not going to stop rescuing children. What I asked, what's that? God's children are not for sale. That's right. Thank you. And that's, and that's exactly what I told President Biden. And the borders are Kamala Harris. The borders are. Wow. And uh, I asked them this question. I, I asked them, standing before the Capitol with the news cameras there, why... Have you made our U.S. border institutions on the border, our agencies, child trafficking delivery services? Because that is what's happening. That's horrifying. Let me explain what I mean by this. The children who are being brought from all around the world, not just Mexico and Central America, they are being brought into this country. Why this country? Because unfortunately, we are the number one consumer of child sex material in the entire world. So the demand is here. We're the number, we're number three, or number two or three, for, uh, for the destination countries for, for human trafficking as well. So they want to get these kids into our dirty markets. That's very important to them. And so what happens is these kids come up. Can you imagine there's been, I mean, 85,000 children just in the last two years under this administration. 85,000 children. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's raised, yeah, it's up to 100,000. Children have come into this country and disappeared. Nobody knows where they are. And these children are unaccompanied. Can you imagine thousands of unaccompanied minors? Some of the, thousands of them, according to CB, CBP data, are as young as five, between one and five years old. Can you imagine a two-year-old showing up unaccompanied, thousands of them at our border? That's what's happening. This summer, I had the opportunity to visit with two presidents in Central America, one in Honduras 
and one in Guatemala. The one in Honduras, super socialist. The one in Guatemala, super conservative. And they both said the exact same thing. Enforce your damn borders. You're killing our children. It's not even political. It's, it's not even about that. Their, their children are stuck. Their children are lost. And these children show up. They show up with a phone number on their phone, written on their arms. This is what they're doing. Or a little paper stuck to their shirt. And has a phone number, the sponsor. This is what I mean by our, our agencies, not by their will. These are good men and women working, in the, in, you know, but they're, they're being forced by the administration to do what they're told. They have to call that number. That, they pick up the number, hey, Joe Trafficker picks up the phone. Yes, yeah, send the kid to this address. Yes, sir. Hang up the phone, no vetting, no background check. Plane, train, automobiles, send that kid up there and buy. And those, were, those are the 100,000 kids in the last just two or three years alone. This is so ungodly, this is so horrific, and I'm so grateful that this is one of the main themes of this conference that we need to end. I, I gave this, um, I was giving this same speech to the, uh, the conservative caucus on the Hill this summer as well, and they said, why can't we get the other, the, the, the left to wake up to this? These are just children. And I, and I expressed to them that never before in the history of America has there been a war on children. And I said, you've got to expand the argument. Take it off the border. Take it to other places, too, and, and, and combine it all so you can see what's happening. It's a spiritual warfare as well. If you don't understand that, you can't understand it. Children are being targeted. Look at what they're, look what they're giving our kids in public schools and calling it sex education. It's pornographic material. They're, they're, they're making our kids little sex robots. And so by, by the time they're 12 years old, and they're, of course, they're, 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 they're messed up and they're confused. And then they say they want to, you know, they, they want to change, you know, they want to gender mutilate. And parents can get tossed in jail in certain states if, if, in, our, in our country if they don't let their kids do this. And you know what? Here's, here's what I discovered. The pedophiles are watching. The pedophiles have had an agenda for decades. You can read about it, like NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association, others in Europe. And they're watching America right now, and they are salivating. Because we are doing, by policy, what they have been calling for for decades. Pornify the kids. Give them sex material. Let the kids choose. They want the kids to vote by 12. And they love that you're letting kids choose to gender mutilate. Why? Because if you can get the kids to be able to choose that, and you've already got them into this mode of sexual, they're so sexualized, then guess what? The, pe the pedophile swoops in and says, let us take care of them. So now the, the, conf the confused 12-year-old says, hey, mom, I want to, I want to, you know, I want to have sex with this 40-year-old man. And he identifies as a 13-year-old anyway, so it doesn't really matter, and it's all cool. And mom says, no, you can't do that. And kid says, you, you said I could do the gender mutilation thing. What's the... You've already lost the debate. There's nowhere else you can go, Mom, because you've already taught your kid that God and science and truth and values don't matter. And so now the pedophiles swoop in, and we're watching this happen. And we have to defeat the pedophile movement. And one, one way they're trying to do this, this is one of the ways they're having success right now, is changing the wording, right? Don't call them pedophiles, right? What are, we, what are we supposed to call them? Mind or attracted people, thank you. They, they want to be included as a protected class, and so they're not scary anymore. This is, this is, this is horrifying what's happening. Our children are under attack, and in, a, in one nation under God, that's a problem because this nation, as you know, was built under, by, by covenant, those founding fathers built this nation under covenant with God, and God has been clear about what he feels about children. If you mess with his children, bad things happen. And you know that the, the iconic the iconic line from Sound of Freedom, God's children not for sale. Not my that's not, that's my second favorite line. My first favorite line was one that Jim Caviezel ad libbed. He made up in the middle of the of the shooting of the scene. It's the scene, and you've all seen the movie. How many have seen the film? Oh, excellent. So you reckon, you remember that scene 
in the cafe, it's very realistic. I, I didn't say what Jim said. I wish I had because it would have been so cool, but I didn't. Everything else is pretty accurate. But what Jim did was right before that pedophile, I'm, I'm going to conclude with, with this, right before the pedophile was about to be arrested, he leans over the table. This is after he got the book, and the book is real. I have that book. Um, he leans over the table, and he says to the kid, or he says to the pedophile, better that a millstone be hung about your neck than that you should hurt one of these little ones. And and the actor didn't know what to say. His, they, they captured his natural response, which was, what does that mean? And it was perfect for the scene. But Caviezel's brilliant, he, he just ad-libbed that. And that's my favorite line because it's a truth that this country has forgotten. This administration most certainly has forgotten. I mean, we've talked about abortion tonight. That's all part of this. It's all part of the war on children. It's, it's, we gotta see it as a collective and fight it and see it for what it is. It's spiritual warfare and Jesus does not like it. And if we stand for Jesus, we must stand for his children. Thank you and God bless. When I was talking to Tim back there, just now leading up to this, he informed me, number one, he walks the walk, talks the talk, as we know. He has nine, nine kids, two adopted, definitely pro-life, but he's also talked to me, spoke to me about, he's starting to consider the Catholic Church and the Catholic faith. <laughs> He showed me the proof right there. Miraculous medal he's wearing, the, the medal of our Blessed Mother. So we're going to pray for this guy, and also we'd like to give him a special award. We would like to recognize Tim for his heroic Patriot Award for what he's done for God and country. Tom Homan was going to be here tonight. He couldn't be here. President asked him to do a favor. Couldn't be here directly. Had a change of plans. Tom Homan is the former director of ICE. He is a Catholic who has found a new love for the Holy Rosary and prays it frequently. When I was talking to him about this event, he was going to be part of this issue, issue four, addressing the crisis at the border. I asked him, Tom, what makes the southern border crisis possible? How does this happen? He said, John, what makes Biden's illegal invasion possible and therefore the human trafficking that results from it are the NGOs. The biggest NGO, and I'm going to say this carefully, you know where I'm going with this, but I want to be very precise in my words. He did say the biggest NGO is Catholic Charities, but 95% of people in Catholic Charities are probably saints. They do so much good work for society. In fact, my friend I was in Michigan with last week told me that they don't make a ton of money. They can't have kids. He knew that going into marriage. But they wanted to adopt. They couldn't afford you know, whatever it is, it costs like $25,000 to adopt a kid and cost, what, 10 bucks to take an abortion pill? They went to Catholic Charities, and Catholic Charities was gracious to them to be able to provide the child. So I want to be very clear, not paying everyone all in the same bucket. However, the fact is, is that there are people in that organization, Catholic Charities, who know exactly what they're doing, and they are the number one NGO, according to the expert himself, the southern border that make this possible. And I have to say this, because we're in politics, we've got to be clear. We can't just let's just pray for a change in the country. 
That NGO is funded via the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, who gets 40% of their budget from our tax dollars. We need to speak up, and we need politicians to address that. We are stewards of the money that God has given us. If the money is going to them, and they're using it, and they don't really care, so they, they receive the kids, kids come in, anyone in the brother can pretty much go up to them and say, I want to adopt a kid. And they're passed off and never tracked again. That's why it was testified in Congress that 85,000 kids are missing. Let's own it. We're scandalizing those who are not Catholic for our role in this. But we can change this. The Catholic vote's important. It's really important. Besides elections. The last three elections, in fact, have been decided by that Catholic vote. We decided to bring an expert on the Catholic vote, someone who's been around in politics longer than this guy's been alive. So when I was talking to Roger, Roger, are you okay with this topic? We think this would be a good pitch. And, and obviously, Roger, I understand. I know you're not a Catholic. You don't identify as a Catholic. He's like, whoa. <laughs> no, no, no. I identify as a Catholic. Really? Okay. So yeah, I hope you don't mind me saying this, Roger, but yeah, I go to church every now and then, but it, I stopped going to the, the main Catholic church because the priest was a communist. <laughs> like, I understand, I understand, but Roger is a man who has a wealth of experience. He's a good man, and he understands politics in a way that few else do, and he's a close friend of the president. His formal biography... He's a seasoned political operative, speaker, pundit, and New York Times best-selling author, featured in the Netflix documentary, Get Me Roger. All of these presidents relied on Roger to secure their seat in the Oval Office. Ronald Reagan, Richard Nixon, Donald Trump. In a 45-year career in American politics, Stone has worked on over 700 campaigns for public office. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give the honor to Roger Stone. Thank you so much. Thank you. What a great, what a great gathering. I can't wait to hear what I have to say. John, thanks. Put me on after Jim Caviezel. Really appreciate that. Folks, I voted today in the historic Florida Republican presidential primary. Well, let's just say I did not vote for Governor Ron DeSantis. No, the polls are now closed. I voted for the greatest president since Abraham Lincoln, Donald J. Trump. And I can report to you that the president swept the Sunshine State primary with over 80% of the vote. And turnout was heavy, which shows the intensity of this man's support and why he is headed back to the White House. What John said is true. I, I was baptized as a Catholic in St. Mary's Church in Norwalk, Connecticut, one of the most beautiful churches you have ever seen. I received my sacraments, my Holy Communion, my confirmation in St. Aloysius Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. As long as I lived under my parents' roof, I went to Mass every Sunday. But I confess to you that when I left for Washington uh, and when I had a terrific career as an advisor to presidents, uh, as a lobbyist, I wandered far from the Lord. And then, as some of you may know, because of my long friendship with President Donald Trump, on the morning of January 25th, 2019, 29 fully SWAT-clad FBI agents swarmed my home at 6 o'clock in the morning. They were brandishing fully automatic uh, 
M4 assault weapons. There were 17 uh, armored vehicles in which they arrived. There was a government helicopter overhead, and they actually pulled two amphibious units up to the dock behind my house. And as my friend Sean Hannity likes to say, frogmen carrying assault weapons jumped out on the dock. All of this to arrest me for the completely fabricated crime, the first time nonviolent crime, of allegedly lying to Congress under oath in my voluntary testimony before the House Intelligence Committee. How does one lie about Russian collusion, which now without dispute does not exist? <laughs> to the extent that I made misstatements to the House Committee, they were entirely immaterial. In other words, they hid no underlying crime. The government, even in my Soviet-style show trial in Washington, D.C., in which, to my surprise, all of my constitutional rights of, to defense were denied me. I was gagged and could not defend myself. My wife and I lost our home. We lost our savings. We lost most of our insurance. I lost my ability to travel. And I was gagged by a judge who would not let me defend myself in public. Yet, to this day, the government has never produced any evidence of either Russian collusion or WikiLeaks collaboration on my part. In fact, by July, it became clear as to why I was being put through this crucible. Uh, it was when they came to my lawyer and said, look, your client's going to die in prison. We know that there have been at least 26 phone calls between your client, Roger Stone, and candidate Trump in 2016. And if he will simply say that these calls pertain to the drop of the WikiLeaks documents as directed by the Russians, we'll write a letter to the judge in his case urging that Mr. Stone receive no jail time. In other words, they wanted me to lie. They put ungodly pressure on me to lie. They wanted me to bear false witness against the president. And I told them that they could go to hell. <laughs> Yet, I confess to you, I was angry. I was frustrated. Uh, I was depressed. I was drinking too much. I was scared, not so much for myself, but for my wife, who is hard of hearing. I didn't know how she would support herself if I was unjustly incarcerated. The morning I was arrested, because she is hard of hearing, she heard none of the ruckus. She didn't know I'd been handcuffed and taken out wearing a Roger Stone did nothing wrong t-shirt. She didn't know there were CNN cameras just totally coincidentally 25 feet from the front door of my house. She woke up looking down the barrel of two assault weapons. Yes, I became distraught. And then, thanks to the solid advice of a phenomenal number of clergymen, Father Grady in Fort Lauderdale, Franklin Graham, Pastor Leon Benjamin, Randy Coggins, and so many others, I finally realized that my only salvation existed in being restored in the blood of the cross. So I confessed my sins. I pledged to the Lord to walk in his way. I admit to you, I am a sinner. I know over at the New York Times and the, the New Yorker and CNN and MSNBC, they, they snicker about this. Oh, Roger Stone uh, is, a, is, a, is a Christian. Roger Stone is a Catholic. You know what? I don't really care what they think. I only care what he thinks. So I am restored as a Catholic. What kind of Catholic am I? I'm a Fulton Sheen Catholic. 
I'm a Joseph R. McCarthy Catholic. Yes, I'm a John F. Kennedy Catholic. As a Nixon man, it's tough for me to admit this, but John Kennedy was an ardent anti-communist. John Kennedy favored a silver-backed dollar. John Kennedy uh, cut taxes on the working families of America. John Kennedy deeply distrusted the intelligence agencies, and he paid for that with his life. What kind of Catholic am I? I'm a Pope John Paul Catholic. I may get excommunicated from the church for saying this, but they can never excommunicate me from Jesus Christ. I don't recognize this pope. Our last legitimate pope was Benedict. And he was forced from the papacy. Yes, only through fervent prayer were my prayers answered. Did President Donald Trump see that I was the target of a politically oriented and motivated prosecution, a persecution, and they were just trying to squeeze me to get at him? Two days before I was to report to a dank Georgia prison where I believe the plan at 68 years old over the lifetime history of asthma was for me to die. The president answered my prayers to Jesus Christ, uh, and he granted me a, a, a commutation of sentence followed that Christmas by a full and complete presidential pardon. Why? Because Roger Stone did nothing wrong. And this has changed my life. 1990, I considered myself a libertarian Republican. I was one of the founders of Republicans for Choice. And then, five years ago, almost concurrent uh, with my restoration in the faith, my first great-grandson was born and I changed my views, the Lord touched my heart. I am proud to say today that I am 100% pro-life. And more importantly, I say to you, this is a fight, this is an issue from which we cannot shy because the position of the Democrats to allow abortion, not only just up until the moment of birth, but after birth, is what New York Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan correctly called infanticide. Their position is the extreme position on abortion. This is a fight that is worth fighting. Let me say that politics was not always like this. There was a time when both parties were anti-communist, when both parties believed in capitalism, when both parties believed in God. But the Democratic Party of John Kennedy and Harry Truman, that party no longer exists. That party has been taken over by a group of radical, atheist Marxists who plan nothing less than the full destruction of this nation and our constitutional freedoms. Don't think that this is a fight between Republicans and Democrats or between liberals and conservatives. This is nothing less than an epic struggle between good and evil. A struggle between light and dark a struggle between the godly and the godless. And you heard Jim Caviezel say it, if we lose, this nation will step off into a thousand years of darkness. But here's the good news. We have the leader for this moment. I have known Donald Trump for 45 years. He was at my wedding. I was at his wedding to Melania. He is an uncommon man. 
He marches to his own drummer. He's not managed, he's not handled, he is not scripted. He is 100% genuine. He is the toughest man I've ever met. Now, when you consider that I worked for Richard Nixon, who lost a race for president and then governor of California, only to claw his way back in the greatest political comeback in American history, and that I worked for Senator Bob Dole, a man who was hit by a shell in Germany, uh, serving his country in World War II, a man who was told he would never walk again, he would never use his hands again, he would never feed himself again, but who, through sheer, sheer willpower, nursed himself back to functionality, to be a great leader, and who would have been a great president. When I tell you Donald Trump is the toughest man I know, that's saying a lot. They seek to destroy him, and he faces all of this with incredible optimism, with incredible, uh, he's incredibly resolute. He's incredibly determined. He's incredibly courageous. Joe Biden said the other day that this is all about Trump. Well, if it were all about Trump, he would just ride off into the sunset. He would just live on this beautiful property or in his palatial skyscraper mansion in the sky in New York or go to his amazing golf clubs. He could live a life of leisure. No, folks, he's not running for him. He is running for us. Look, I'm proud of my Catholic heritage. I am half Italian and half Hungarian. I'm Italian from the waist down. <laughs> I'm proud to stand with all my fellow Catholics. Now, some will say, well, wait a minute, Stone, we, we saw you at, at the Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church worshiping on a Sunday, it's true. See, I was going to a, the local Catholic church, but I had real problems with their masking uh, and their social distancing in violation of Florida state law, and when I threatened to sue the Arch District, I was politely told that I was no longer welcome in church. So yes, I do attend Sunday services at Coral Ridge. It was founded by Dr. D. James Kennedy. It was actually dedicated by one of the greatest men of the 20th century, Reverend Billy Graham. But let me also say, I say the rosary every single day. Because if you are baptized as a Catholic, you are a Catholic, you will live as a Catholic, you will die as a Catholic, and I am proud of my Catholic faith. It is not a secret that my political mentor was Richard Nixon. Uh, I'm also proud to have worked in three campaigns for governor, later President Ronald Reagan, uh, and of course, I'm one of the earliest people in the country to urge my friend Donald Trump to run for president. It was Richard Nixon who said that the greatness comes not when things go always good for you, but when you are tested, uh, when you suffer some defeats, some setbacks, when you're disappointed, when sadness comes, because until one has been in the deepest valley, one cannot appreciate the majesty of the highest mountaintop. He also said that a man is not finished when he is defeated. He is only finished when he quits. My fellow Catholics, my fellow Americans, I implore you to join me in the final battle because in the fight for America, I, for one, will never quit. God bless you. Many hands make light work.
This event, as I told you before, we're getting near the end, but we're ready to do the most important thing, which is to pray. Pray for the president. Pray for the country. This event was a miracle in all of itself. The time, the people that got together. I want to recognize one of those individuals. His name is Cameron Moore. Cameron, get up here. This guy, he's not a Catholic. We got to know him, as many patriots in the room have gotten to know him the last few years. He has nothing to gain and everything to lose. And what he did to make this event possible, helping us here at Mar-a-Lago, permissions there, this person, that person, that person, a ton. It has inspired not only me, but many of us, Cameron. And I want to recognize you, brother. You, every time there's, you know, when, when someone like helps you out, you're always like, okay, so what are they trying to do underneath? Like, you know, what's that second, you know, DC politics? Like, what's the end game for them? Every time I thought, what's Cameron doing? It just, he continues so. It's just for love of the country, man, and love of God. And you have inspired me, sir. I'd like to recognize you and we have all calves for your service of God and country. Come over here, get the word, Cameron. You guys, the real deal. That's how this country was founded, and that's how we're going to have a rebirth of freedom, as Jim said. Another friend in the fight from day one of Catholics for Catholics is someone that you all know and love. They had a clip of him earlier today on one of the videos, and there was a spontaneous eruption, which proves my point. He is the senior advisor to Catholics for Catholics and has been more than an advisor, but has been a friend. With more than 33 years of service in the United States military and current chairman of America's future, General Michael Flynn's military career culminated as a director of the Defense Intelligence Agency and as the nation's highest serving military intelligence officer. <laughs> All right, buddy. Give me a big hug. It's like, sit down, because we're going to, I know when I go to church, for all, all the Catholics that are in here, when I go to church and that church, that priest starts getting a little bit long-winded, I'm like, I'm heading out the back door there. So we still, have a, we still have the rosary that we're going to do here shortly. I'm only going to take a minute. This is really, really important. And, uh, and I think that there's things that come out of tonight and the things that come out of tonight are words like fearlessness. Everybody that was up here, everybody that I've met here tonight, we have to be fearless. Okay, I want everybody to, when you go, when you go home or you think about, you wake up tomorrow morning, I want you to read the whole of Psalm 23. The whole of Psalm 23. I've lived it. I have lived Psalm 23, my family and I. We've lived it. This country is in the middle of Psalm 23, yea, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. But we are in the, we're in the valley right now, America, Catholics, people in this audience, anybody that listens to this. This country is in the valley of the shadow of death. How, I mean, when did we ever start talking about communism, socialism? Donald Trump said it. In a State of the Union, while I was going through my persecution, and I think it was 2018 State of the Union, and he stood up there, that was a very famous one where Nancy was ripping it apart. How dare she? And he stood there and he said, America will never be a socialist nation. For a president of the United States of America to stand there in a State of the Union and have to warn, have to make that statement, yet here we are. We are in the valley of the shadow of death. And we have got to fear no evil. We have got to be fearless. We have, 
We have got to be courageous. We have got to be accountable. We have got to be strong men and women. You know, one thing, I, I always carry a, a, a constitution with me, and I, and I studied the, the uh, Federalist Papers as just one of the things that I like to read. You know, we always talk about the First Amendment, because the First Amendment, a lot, of, a lot of things, a lot of the speakers today talked about the First Amendment, things surrounding the First Amendment. But the big argument with, with the First Amendment, because most people say the First Amendment is the freedom to get out there and speak the way that you want to speak. But the big argument by the founders, if you really know the First Amendment, the very first part is five parts. Five parts of the First Amendment. Five. Most people don't know that. Most people just think First Amendment gives me the freedom to speak. There's five parts. The very first part. And you have to put yourselves in that period of time when they were standing there arguing about what they were going to give us because they were going to give us promises. That's what the Bill of Rights is. The fulfillment of those promises is in the Constitution. But the very first promise was the promise to practice our religion. That's the very first point in the First Amendment. Religion. So when, when we hear, and they're going to start to do this, they're going to put the labels on us, Christian nationalists, all this crazy stuff. And I've already heard it the last couple of weeks about the separation of church and state. That's total nonsense. Total nonsense. Total nonsense. And you're going to hear more of this. That this is going, we are going to be attacked. That valley that we are in, that valley that we are all in, this country is in it right now. I have personally, I've personally been there. My wife and I lived it. We lived it. But we exited. There's two lights, two lights at the end of that valley. One is bright. It's bright, shiny light. It's easy to get to. It's easy to get to because somebody is at the end of that valley and they want to give you something, right? They want to give you stuff. They want to make you feel good. They want to do all these good things for you. They want to own you. There's another light. It's really dim. It's really, really dim. You can barely see it. And it, and it seems like it's a real long distance off. And it is. And to get to that light requires sacrifice, requires discipline, requires a determination that I know is in the DNA of every single American. And if we don't wake up, if we don't stand up, we don't stand our ground, put our voices out there, protect these beautiful children, fight for the next generation, have voter turnout that is like not 35 or 40 percent, but voter turnout that's like 90, 95 percent in this country. We have got to have that. The Catholic, and these people know it, the Catholic vote in this country, you cannot become the president of the United States unless you've got the Catholic vote. You can't. And most of these crazy Catholics, and I've been one my whole life, most of these crazy Catholics, they still don't know which way to vote. That's how I found Father Altman, because when he said, you can't be a Catholic and, and Democrat. So, long night. I could stand up here and talk all night. But I, I just want to say to John Yep and, and this beautiful organization, Catholics for Catholics, this organization is just getting going. We are just getting started. We are just getting started. And when, when, the, when the United States Council of Catholic Bishops, and they didn't even read their own damn writing, they came after that title because they think that they own it. What they own is they own the word Catholic, seriously. The Council of Catholic Bishops has proprietary ownership of the word Catholic. Doesn't say Catholic, it says Catholics, plural. All of us, all of us standing together, 
And I don't care whether you're Presbyterian, Lutheran, it doesn't matter to me. This nation was built on a set of Judeo-Christian principles and values, and we have to be fearless about that. So thank you so much for being here tonight. God bless you all, and get ready to say the prayer. God bless America. Thank you. We love General Flynn, and as General said, that was the most important part of the night. Many of the speakers have referenced that they use this. This is powerful, and I want, I know it's been, it's getting late, but realize what we're doing. You represent millions of Catholics across the country right now who would actually love to be here right now. But you are here, and you're, we are going to join in prayer, the, that sacred prayer the Blessed Mother gave us and taught us, the Holy Rosary. I would like to invite every single one of the speakers that spoke to come back on stage, and we are going to pray the Holy Rosary. You're free to stand or sit or kneel, whatever you prefer, but the speakers can come up. And as they're doing this, you may be like, what is, what is this? See that picture right there? Picture of a lady. Maybe you've never seen that one before. It's a very significant picture. Why? The first president, who was not a baptized Catholic, had in his room that picture. It was on his bedside table, and it's still there in Mount Vernon. They have the museum, the original in the museum. Why? What about the Blessed Mother was so special that George Washington wanted that picture close to him? She leads us to Christ, who's, there's no salvation outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. She leads us to him. She intercedes. We don't worship her. We ask her for intercession. I would like Father, Father Eric, to come up. Father Eric is one of those courageous priests, came all the way from Wichita, Kansas, and is, will be leading us in the Holy Rosary. Thank you, everyone. Or, thank you, John. And can everybody hear the great words we've heard today? <clears throat> Got some preaching lessons from Jim Caviezel. Yeah. How about, I know you've been received some rosaries, am I correct? Let us, if you have the rosary, you do not have to stand. You just lift it up. Lift up the rosary. I'm, right. <laughs> he gave me holy water. I can't sprinkle all of you. All right. Our help is in the name of the Lord. May Almighty God bless these rosaries. May they lead us to Christ through the intercession of Our Lady, who always said yes to Jesus, to God, and to the Holy Spirit. And this rosary protect us from all evil, draw us into a greater strength to be greater Catholics, greater Christians, and better Americans, and to bring this country back to a, an intention of freedom to give glory to God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried, descended to hell. On the third day, he rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> For an increase of faith, hope, and charity in our lives, hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus.
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thine mercy. From the joyful mysteries this evening, the Annunciation, Archangel Gabriel speaks to Mary, says that she will conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit, and Mary says yes, she is his living yes that shows us how to say yes to God. And so we thank for, for the gift of that yes, and we may say yes to our Lord and to each other in Christ's love. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O oh, my Jesus, save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thine mercy. Let Mary your praises we sing. You reign now in heaven with Jesus our King. Ave, Ave, Ave Maria, Ave, Ave Maria. Second joyful mystery is the visitation. The fruit of the mystery is love of neighbor. So Mary goes in haste to, to Judea to visit Elizabeth, her kinswoman, her, her cousin. And so they have this beautiful relationship of these two women, both pregnant, one with the great, greatest prophet and the other with our Savior, and they speak to each other. And the fruit of that mystery with love of neighbor, may we take this fruit uh, that we have learned tonight when meeting new friends and to be strengthened by words we have heard and with the grace of God, go out back into the, every corner of our country and proclaim his love for us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us in the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thine mercy. In heaven the blessed, your glory proclaim. On earth we, your children, invoke your fair name. joyful mystery is the birth of our Lord in Bethlehem. On this day we remember in a special way St. Joseph, this great solemnity, great protector of the incarnate word and loving devotion to Our Lady in his purity and chastity to guide this family. Pray that the simplicity of Bethlehem may touch our lives so we may simply just follow the Lord and bring him to others. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. We pray for our mother, the church of honor. The next mystery is the presentation of the child Jesus in the temple. Mary and Joseph are living their faith, their, their way of life. Let us pray for families to live their Christian life and to keep the Lord's day holy and to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thine mercy. Immaculate Mary, your praises we sing.
fifth joyful mystery is the, the finding of the Christ child in the temple. Jesus is 12 years old and he must be in the Father's house. And Mary and Joseph know they must care for him. So they find him and in joy they bring him home and ground him for about 18 years. <laughs> but anyway, so we must have joy as well in finding Jesus. We must open our hearts and, and let him in and let him guide the freedom that God has made us to live within. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Oh, my Jesus, save us from the fires of hell. All souls, the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thine mercy. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulcedo, Espes Nostra Salve, A Te Clamamus, Excellent St. Michael the Archangel, defend in the battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. 
May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan all the evil spirits who prowl throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. We will finish this night with a consecration of the country and the President Trump and the First Lady, consecration and the intercession of St. Joseph, that they will be protected in the name of Jesus Christ, that the demons who try to stop this great country will be thwarted through the power that belongs to the husband, the blessed mother, foster father of Jesus Christ. It will be prayed in the sacred language of our church in Latin with the words in English on this screen. Bob. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritui Sancti. Ad te beate Iosef, in tribulazione nostra confucinus, adque implorato sponse tu, tua sanctissime auxilio, patrocinium quoque tuum fidentur exposimus. Per eam quesumus quetu, quete cum immaculata virgi, virgine dei genitrice coniuixi, caritatem perque paternam, quope puerum jesurum amplexus es, amarum, Supli, supplices, deprecamur ut ad eridatem, quam Jesu Christo acquisivit sanguine, sanguine suo, pedinus respicias, ag necessitatibus nostris tua virtute et ope sucuras. Tu ere o custos providentissime divine familiae Jesu Christi sobolem electam, proibe a nobis, amantissime pater, Omni errorum ac correptelarum luem. Propitius nobis, sospitator noster fortissime, in hocum potestate tenebrarum certamine, et celo adesto, et sicut olim puerum jejum et sumo eripuisti vite. Discrimine ita nuc ecclesiam sanctam de ab hostilibus insidiis aque ab omni adversitate defende, nosque singulus perpetuo tege patrocinio, ut a tui exemplar et ope tua sufliti, sancte vivire, pie e more sempiternamque, in celis beatitudinem a sequi possimus. Amen. This concludes our night. Thank you to all of you for we we inspire each other, and that's the truth. Each one doing their part. As General Flint said, it has just begun. Let us go and deliver that Catholic vote for the greatest president in our lifetime, President Donald Trump. God bless you all.